Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. As an investor, Pascal Gauthier, the CEO of Ledger, one of the most well-known hardware wallets and companies in our industry, one of the first companies to make crypto hardware wallets, he says one thing when companies and different projects come in front of him. He asks, who's your competition? If you don't have any competition, that can mean that you're either onto something huge, like something else that no one has thought of yet, or it could also mean that you're banging your head against the wall, maybe literally. Pascal and I spent the day talking about Ledger and we talked about what he looks at on different companies and projects that are transforming the industry and igniting a revolution. As CEO and one of the first investors of Ledger, he is like in the perfect position to take the company forward. We talked about the origins of Ledger and how they revolutionized Bitcoin wallets, making a transformational leap from USB sticks, which were something that everyone used back then, to the hardware wallet as we know it today. We discussed in depth the French technology of Ledger and why he thinks France has some of the best developers in the world. Pascal shows optimism for the future of crypto and Bitcoin and emphasizes that they're in it for the long run. The early players of crypto, Pascal and myself included, we believe that there's a long road ahead and we discuss the idea of making the world a better place to live in with Bitcoin, with crypto, with Ledger, and with all of us working together. I can't wait to share this episode with you guys and I'll talk to you right after the ends. I'm so honored that Untold Stories is sponsored by eToro. eToro is the smartest crypto trading platform and one of the largest in the world with over a trillion dollars in trading volume per year. What I really love about eToro is that the CEO has been around the Bitcoin space since 2012, so they really, really put their money where their mouths are. U.S. customers, myself included, we can trade the most popular crypto assets, in fact, almost all of the ones that you want to trade, with low but transparent fees. So you actually know what you're paying for everything. And that's really, really, really important. So if you're not ready to trade yet, you can practice building your portfolio with the eToro $100,000 virtual trading feature. So you can create this whole portfolio without trading with any real money to see how you'll do. And you can learn all the different ins and outs without using any real money yet. And then once you're comfortable, you can enter the market and start buying and selling crypto for real. Best of all, one of my favorite features is that you can connect with 11 million other eToro traders in the world, myself included. And we can talk trading, charts, and all things crypto. So listen, head on over to eToro.com. Links are in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. I want to thank and give credit to the first ever sponsor of Untold Stories, Scott Offer. Scott is a Bitcoin mining consultant, and I really want you guys to check out one of his coolest apps that's free to use. It's a Bitcoin mining profitability calculator that you can check it out before you get involved in mining, or if you just want to learn more about whether mining is profitable and how it works. The website is CryptoMining.Tools. That's CryptoMining.Tools. You can enter your estimated uptime and get more realistic profit projections. It includes really cool features like the impact of the Bitcoin block reward having, which is actually coming up extremely soon. Their API allows you to embed profitability calculators and other live data directly into your own website, all for free. Also, if you're wondering which miner is the most efficient or has the best chance of breaking even, you should try out their interactive hardware comparison chart. So it's a hardware comparison chart. So you can compare all different types of miners for all different coins and tokens. And it's interactive. So you can play around with it. It's by far the best tool if you have any questions about mining or if you want to learn more about mining. It's the best tool you can check it out. As a mining consultant, Scott helps you make data-backed business decisions. He will be involved in the process if you want to buy a miner, if you want to sell a miner, if you have miners and need to get into data centers. I mean, if you follow Scott on Twitter, even if you're not in the mining industry, you learn so much. I follow him. It's super cool. You can check it out on Twitter or Telegram at 
Offered Scott. That's O F F O R D S C O T T. That's O F F O R D S C O T T. Again, I want to give a special thanks to Scott. You were my first sponsor when the show was just launching. Thank you so much. Untold Stories wouldn't be here without the amazing production company, Blockworks Group. A few months ago, I approached Blockworks Group and I said, Hey guys, I want to do a show, Untold Stories. Can we make it happen? And these guys are the only event and podcast production company that I trust. Really, the show is powered by them, and it wouldn't be here today without the amazing work of the Blockworks Group team. So for access to all the premier digital asset conferences and to check out their other podcasts in their network that they produce, check them out at BlockworksGroup.io. That's BlockworksGroup.io. I promise you will not be disappointed. Over the course of the last, I don't know, like 10 years, I feel like narratives have changed. One specific narrative I'm talking about, and the reason I bring this up is because, you know, we're still seeing exchanges get hacked and we're still seeing, you know, like, oh, yeah, 340,000 Ether stolen from the exchange. No problem. The company's going to cover it. $50 million, $100 million. It's great. They cover it. It's great until they can't. And how many exchanges do we see that just disappear? So what am I talking about when I say narratives? What I mean by that is that it used to be over time, um, we said that exchanges are too centralized and even exchanges themselves would say, don't keep your money here. What do you mean by that? Exactly what I said. Exchanges would literally say, don't keep your money here when you're not trading. And we felt like going forward, as the as this industry continues to grow, we'd be moving away from centralized exchanges where hacks can happen, exit scams can happen. So now the narrative I feel like uh, that has changed is now you have all these distributed finance companies, the DeFi, you have all these different products and companies and exchanges that is now saying, hey, keep your money with us keep it here. We're going to offer you interest rates. You can earn money. You can borrow against your Bitcoin uh, or your Ether. You can do staking on all these different exchanges. So that narrative has changed. Um, please welcome my guest today, Pascal Gutier, who is the president and CEO of Ledger Hardware Wallet. Pascal, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So the reason I you know, prefaced with this narrative is because your company and you decided early on you know going back to 2014 that you guys were going to change you know change the narrative and decide to instead of waiting um you said that the market needs a product and we're going to build the product and we're going to launch it and we're going to allow people to 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 take control of their money you know not not your money not your keys as they said not your keys not your money do you do you see this same narrative? I mean, now you've been in the crypto space for a few years now. Do you see the same narrative um, that people are talking about? And are you worried that people are still keeping their money at exchanges? Yes, I think. Uh, <clears throat> look, you know, the uh, the industry is trying to to form. So, um, and and I always compare the crypto bitcoin i mean this these new protocols uh to the internet if you look at the formation of the internet you you had a you know a technology then you had a set of applications built on the build on the technology and then those applications changed over time and and what you have in in 2019 and entering 2020 is very very different from what you had in 1995 and so i think uh similarly for for crypto and Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies in general, you will have the same evolution in terms of application that run on top of the protocol. Uh, and I feel that, you know, you're referring to security specifically. I think security has been done in a certain way uh, uh, at the beginning, you know, um, the cold storage versus the hot wallet uh, type, of, uh, type of security. I also feel that you had a first set of applications that sort of won the early game and those applications were more like centralized value propositions such as Coinbase, exchanges, et cetera, et cetera. But I think probably what we'll see in the future is more decentralization and, you know, to the promise of actually these protocols uh, and more products and, and technologies that uh, 
that actually um, go in the way of decentralization, but providing the same, you know, uh, same ease of use that you have with a central value proposition, uh, but probably higher security. Like, I agree with you, and I and I hope that's happening, and I want that to happen. Um, I guess being in the space a little bit long, you know, a little bit long, I, I I'm a little bit jaded, and you know, I get worried sometimes that basically we're going in the right direction, and then that direction changes. Let's go back to when Ledger was founded. When Ledger was founded, there were no real hardware wallets in the space. Let's go back to 2014. Ledger has become probably the top two in the top two or even top one has become the most well-known if not the most but one of the two well most well-known hardware wallets in the space i have one sitting in my drawer when you launched in 2014 there was no hardware wallet space there it, it, it didn't exist so your company saw a um a need for for this and decided to to launch it and when I was doing my research and going back, it looks like, you know, you guys really did take security to the next level. And I want to ask you more about that in a little bit. You know, you guys took it to the next level by launching your own operating system called Bolos. Um, and then you talk about your hardware security models, modules. I want to learn more about this and I want to understand how that actually works. And in your view, why the company uh, was actually founded was there a specific need for a specific person and said, hey, we need to actually have better security? Because you remember before, it was just like Casatius coins and, and paper wallets. There was no real version of, of security. For sure. Uh, I mean, I can tell you exactly how it was founded. But uh, interestingly enough, like you had several teams working in France. You actually had three and they were working in crypto and they were doing sort of different things. Uh, one team was actually... Sort of selling Bitcoin, if you like, but they were shipping Bitcoin to users on USB sticks. And you had a, you had another team which were which was an engineering team, and all those engineers came from the chip and pin technology. So the chip and pin is what you have on your credit card. And actually, the chip and pin technology has been protecting secrets for the past 20, 20 years in the banking industry and telecommunication industry. And so that team reached out to the first team to say, "Hey, actually, using USB sticks to send Bitcoin is not very safe." But we have a technology actually that is the that that comes from the chip and pin technology that can protect secrets, and we could build like a hardware that would be more secure than a USB stick to uh, to to send the bitcoins. And so those guys started to work together, and finally they uh, they both came to Paris because Eric Larchevêque, uh, founder and uh, and former CEO just before me, uh, had like uh, something called a Coin House in Paris, La Maison du Bitcoin in French. And the three teams met and decided to build Ledger together. So actually, the use case sort of existed. Like, how do you send Bitcoin to to someone using the mail? And USB stick is not a great value proposition. So it started like that. And and then in two, the end of 2014, beginning of 15, like they had like the first the first product, and they were pitching investor. I was actually the first investor to uh, to join the company. Uh, but the reality is, you know, no one knew at the time that uh, we would create a consumer a hardware consumer uh, category, because right now, you know, the hardware wallet is actually something. There are several companies that are that are doing it. You have uh, there's a lot now. The market is somewhat saturated, maybe not super saturated, but in my drawer, I probably have at least eight or nine different different ones. Yeah, completely, completely. But it's a testimony that it's a real category that is being built. I always say that you know, if you have one company in the world doing one thing, you know, either you be, you have become very big very quickly and. You, you have eaten everyone around you. But if you have several companies working on one problem, it probably means that there is a market uh, and or that there will be a market. So actually, we are very bullish about the hardware wallet business uh, going forward because we believe that for cryptocurrency, but every other blockchain application, I mean, a hardware wallet is, is just a, a piece of hardware that allow you to validate transactions and store uh, safely private keys. And I, we, we, we believe that the hardware wallet will have various type of applications going forward. So it's a category that's been created. A lot of people are working on that problem. So competition is is actually really good. It pushes everyone to do better and uh, and it builds the market. It's interesting that you say that because you were a venture partner at Mosaic Ventures. And I feel like if a potential entrepreneur walked into your office and said, hey, I'm looking to raise money. And you said, who is your competition, right? Because that would be one of your questions. It would be in slide decks. 
who who is your competition and that com- and that person said no one else is doing this you're you're in your head at least i would say is like well who are you that you figured it out or like this is so good or the market doesn't actually kind of need it you've probably heard some some crazy wild ideas uh as a vc no sure i mean the, the difficulty with crypto in general when you raise money is that because it's uh it's an unproven business i mean the the industry itself is unproven what is bitcoin anyways like you know it's you know when you try to raise money you uh it's it's often very different from uh, just building a new uh, a new mobile application for 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 games you know you have you can compare you can you can find market standards, etc. So with Bitcoin and crypto, everything is new. It's, I feel that it's less and less actually. Now we probably know how to better compare, and there is much more volume, etc. So going forward, I think it, w- it would be easier to pitch crypto businesses, but at the time, it's very difficult. And you know, as a VC, it's always the same problem. Like when you look at a company, is it uh, a company that is uh, sort of a transformation of an ecosystem, or is it a pure revolution? Uh, transformation of an ecosystem is like you have a business that exists and you just do it a different way and you're going to try to grab market share in an existing business. And that's a transformation. Uh, most investments are in businesses that transform something. Uh, but the true revolutions are very rare. And actually with Bitcoin and crypto, I feel it's a true revolution. And so therefore, you know, it's always a high risk, high reward type of investment. Um, uh, and Ledger was in, in 2014, early 15. It was high risk, high reward. Like you couldn't compare it to anything. You wouldn't know whether it would become a thing. Uh, most VCs would say that no one needs another piece of hardware and all everything will go into a phone or won't exist. And, uh, and we proved so far everyone wrong. And, you know, we're investing in, uh, in our product and in R and D. So, so it gets even better in the future. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, high risk, high reward. This is the VC game. I've been following you guys for a few years because um, I go to a lot of conferences and I'll see, for example, at Bitcoin Miami this January, uh, last Janu- January, I remember seeing uh, Ledger had a boot there. Um, I've been following you guys. I'm very loyal to to brands. So I have a hardware wallet that I've been using for many years and it may not be the best one, but I guess I have this, this brand loyalty, uh, not issue, but this brand loyalty thing where I like... Um, I like specific brands. So a few weeks ago, I started using my, my ledger more so I can prepare for this and be able to tell you, you know, what I thought of it. And I have to say, I was extremely impressed. But what I was more impressed was about, like you said, about the R and D and about how much, uh, you guys are constantly updating and making it better. So you, you joined, you joined the company as CEO, um, about a year ago, correct? Uh, no less than that, actually, six months ago, and I didn't join the company then. I was no, no, of course, yeah, you were you were before, but I was, uh, but as as CEO, you joined six months ago. Correct. And um, so, congratulations. First, a lot of our listeners, we, uh, a lot of our listeners, probably uh, thousands of them are are using the ledger, and you're going to be leading the company forward. You come from from the advertising industry, and you were extremely extremely successful there. Um, as someone now who's going to be, you know, leading the company forward and continuing to upgrade. How did you fall in love with with Bitcoin and with this crypto space? You were saying a little bit earlier that you you think this is the future. And um, when did that happen for you? When did that light bulb go off? When did you become, you know, ideologically in in love with with the space? I think the keyword here is ideologically. Um, well, it so is the keyword, right? <laughs> it is. Uh, my, my mother is a philosophy teacher, so I've been trained in, uh, into, oh, cool. into these kind of things. But uh, the story is I met with Vences Cesares in 2014, CEO at Zappo. And, uh, and I didn't really understand Bitcoin then, but then he pitched Bitcoin to like a few people and I was lucky to be there. And everything he said makes sense and I understood. And it was the time, it was after being successful in advertising. So it was the time that I was sort of soul searching into where to invest my time and money. Um, and you have to understand that when you're in France and in advertising, for example, even though we build a great company, we were always battling with Google, Facebook, etc. So it felt like, you know, those kind of battles where you know that you have lost but you're still fighting every day. So it didn't feel great. Um, and so I thought to myself at that time that the internet protocol were sort of crushed by the GAFAs on one side and the Chinese companies on the other side. And so, you know, what do you do when you build a company, you try to find an unfair advantage. Uh, and so I thought that, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general, 
but it was only Bitcoin at the time. It was like a new protocol. Uh, so it was like a green field. You could build everything. It actually doesn't matter whether you're French, English, German, American, etc., because the market is global right away. And it felt that in France, we had some unfair advantage. Uh, Ledger is one example. The technology that Ledger uses is actually technology that's been invented in France. Um, I also started another company called Kaiko.com, which is a market data company. And in France, actually, we're known to have very good developers, very good mathematicians. Uh, we are, you know, we're very good in, in finance in general. And when you go to London and New York, you see a bunch of French people in the, uh, in the financial institutions because we're, we're good at that. So it felt that starting from France and working on that Bitcoin problem was probably a great idea. And also, I thought that I would meet, ex meet extraordinary people. Uh, one, you know, when you work on something, people are usually the most important factor. Have you met any? Introduce them to me. <laughs> I met a lot of extraordinary people. Actually. I know. <laughs> you know, Vences, I think, is quite extraordinary. Arthur, uh, CEO at BitMEX, I think, is an extraordinary guy. You know, interesting, like people with big dreams and, you know, trying to change things. And, you know, and they do it in a different way. But I, I, I feel that I've met uh, a lot of very interesting people along the way. Uh, and that's, you know, that was the reason. So, you know, Greenfields potentially building something huge with extraordinary people. So why not? Do you think um, we're still attracting those extraordinary people to our space today? I think yes, but different kind. Uh, there is a, a short TV series called, I think it's called Yukon or something like that. It's about the gold rush. And they, in the miniseries, they sort of show you how gold rush are done. And at first you have uh, the adventurers, uh, so people that, you know, sort of uh, uh, pick the gold from the ground and then they drink a lot, they spend everything in, in guns and liquor, etc., and then they move to the next venture. Uh, after the adventurers, you have the, the white colors that are bored uh, in their job, and that's the second wave. And the third wave is the financial institutions, like the big, uh, the big guys uh, that finally buy out all the white colors and, and then do it uh, very professionally. Uh, so I think we're in the second phase in, in crypto, uh, and I'm probably one of these guys, like one of the white colors that is a bit more adventurous and, and, and venture into these lands. And I came after the cyberpunks and, you know, the real adventurous people. Um, and I think we're still in that phase. So more and more people convert from, you know, sort of uh, financial institutions to crypto because it's coming, it's becoming mainstream because, you know, with crypto and blockchain now they're, uh, many things that uh, that you can do, and it has opened many doors. Uh, and so, yeah, I think uh, this is the phase that we're in right now. You said your mother teaches philosophy, so you understand the importance of having, you know, a moral compass or being grounded uh, in, in in certain beliefs and understandings. Where do you, you know? Um, I have not studied philosophy. You know, I've experienced I've experienced getting involved in in Bitcoin early, and um, I kept myself around groups of people that were very ideological in anarcho-capitalism, libertarianism, and all these various different kind of ideologies. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about like ideology when it comes to uh, an industry like ours? Is, there, I guess you can argue that there was a place for it then. Is there still a place for ideology now? Is it bad or good for, for an industry? Yeah, no, sorry. Like I missed, I missed that point earlier because we said ideology is a keyword, and then I went about uh, business and people. But um, you know, ideology was also, I think, it's very important. So basically, when you do advertising, the one thing that you say to yourself every day is that you're definitely not curing cancer. So you know, you're just trying to sell more shit to people, etc. So it's a fascinating industry. It's great, but you're not solving. Uh, any major problem for for people, uh, and I was very frustrated always in advertising because when you present your company, um, you know you have to have like a, a vision, a mission, etc. And so I always thought that when you do your vision and your mission for an advertising company, it's always like a little bit bullshit because I don't know, like you know, yeah, again, you're not solving a big problem. You're just printing more ads or trying to influence people more, etc. But it doesn't feel grand as a you want to feel good when you're working. You want to feel like you're doing something good. So I guess right. uh, it's harder to do that working in the advertising space. Although I know a lot of people in the advertising space that would, you know, not agree with me. But I guess they're biased because they're in it. But no, but I agree with you. You're. I guess what you're trying to tell me is ideology is good because you know you don't have to. You you have to motivate your people to work and you have to motivate yourself to get up every day. But when there's like this external motivation. 
it makes, I guess, your job a little bit easier. So even, you know, producing this show, I have seven, eight people that work directly on this show at least 10 to 20 hours a week. Um, I love motivating them, but at the same time, because they all love crypto, I have that innate motivation that allows us to continue going when things get a little bit difficult. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's all about changing the world. What do you do every day where you change the world? And when you turn around in 15 years, you're sort of proud of what, about what you've done. And, you know, honestly, like, you know, I started with the internet in 2000 and I've worked in advertising, but, uh, you know, for me, uh, advertising was sort of mean to an end because it was, it was all about building the internet and building services on internet. I always felt part of like the internet community trying to build this business. And again, like people now don't remember, but if you go back to 2000, most people didn't believe the internet was a thing. Most people didn't believe that, you know, those dot-com companies will, will go anywhere. It was actually a joke in uh, 2019. Now, you know, people live and breathe with the internet. It's not even a thing anymore. You hear here and there that some, some companies still have to do their digitalization or whatever, but like, you know, it's, uh, it's completely mainstream and that took sort of 20 years or 25 years. And, uh, and to me, it was fascinating. So, you know, and what I saw in Bitcoin was the same movement, uh, but it's 1995 today or maybe 1990 or something like that. And so it's, uh, I, I came in for the long game. I read something the other day online. I think it was Ryan uh, from Missouri was saying this is like, can anyone tell me something so I can believe again in, in Bitcoin or whatever? I mean, I don't need anyone to tell me something to believe in Bitcoin or, or crypto as a global phenomenon. I think it's here to say, I think it's amazing. I, still I read that tweet too. I read that tweet yeah. too when I was going to respond and I, and I didn't, but let me tell you, and, and I'm, you know, Pascal, I'm really happy you brought that up because that's something that I feel like I struggle with and a lot of people struggle with. And, and he's right to struggle with that. And I think it's okay. Um, I think that Ryan sometimes will exaggerate, um, but understanding what Ryan has been through, there's no one who's been more jaded by this industry. I mean, he was the one who broke the Mt. Gox story that Mt. Gox was insolvent, and he didn't want to break that. Him and I, was, so when that when he got so when Mt. Gox first got insolvent, this is a crazy. I know this is untold stories of you, but I'm gonna tell a story. Um, do you remember Mt. Gox imploded? It was like 2000 and I don't know, like 13 or something like that. And everyone, I mean, I'm still going through, uh, you know, trying to get my money back from that. A lot of our friends are. But when Mt. Gox imploded, the way the way it was found out was there was a report that was written internally by Mt. Gox. And that report stated that Mt. Gox was insolvent and they didn't have the money. Now, uh, Ryan Selkis actually at the time was the only one who got that report. He got it before anyone else did. And he struggled for like a day or two whether to release it. Now understand, I guess, um, let's, let's do an exercise. Like if you were in possession of a document that you prove, that you can prove was, uh, real, you know, and, and the document basically showed that the, that, that hundreds of millions of dollars was actually lost. And now tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people are going to be out of the money. Now, if you release that document, then you know, whatever happens, happens, the shit hits the fan, everyone's fucked. If you don't re- release that document, maybe the company can continue, you know, somehow get that money back. I mean, what would you do in Ryan's position? I, I think about this all the time. I don't know what I would do, to be honest. Well, I would release, I mean, in a heartbeat, in a sense that, you know, there are two things that are important in life, you know, uh, family, good health, and the rest, I mean, it's just business. So, uh, you know, and, and Carl- I love that quote. Karma, karma is important to me. So if I know that something is wrong, I will, and I'm in a position to report it. And I know it's true. Like, you know, I, I don't want to be a, a fake whistleblower, but uh, no, for sure I'll report it. And then, you know, what happened and actually the story, the story later uh, tells that it was actually a good thing to report it. And actually because of Mungox uh, collapsing, uh, this is why I joined uh, crypto uh, because I thought it was a great moment to join crypto. Um, I, you know, it didn't, it didn't kill the potential of crypto at all. It was just an incident. Uh, crypto and Bitcoin has proven super resilient, uh, as a result. Uh, so actually, you know, sometimes it looks very negative at the moment, but it's actually in the long run, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's extremely positive. Uh, and the big banking system was never broken, uh, because it got, you know, hacked so many times, actually, it's part of 
it's part of finance. Like if you have money, people will try to steal it from you, or you know, there there will be wrongdoing. So actually, it's you can say that again. Yeah, no, but it's a sign that it's actually working. Like people pay attention and they try to steal something because it actually has value. So it was a proof that the whole thing had value. Um, and you know, I started because of Mungox partially because when I started the internet, I was very I'm much younger then, but it was uh, just before the bubble crashed. And so, and the bubble of the internet was huge. It was nine trillion. Okay. And the nine trillion went down to, I don't know, like a sub, sub a trillion, I think. But the, the internet bubble was uh, uh, 10 times the magnitude of any bubbles that we had in crypto. Um, and I joined uh, just before the bubble bursted and I stayed and, 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 and invested my time in the. Uh, you came at the best time. Yeah. The best time to join this, this space is right when a bubble's about to burst, because yeah. then you're going to go through the worst times exactly. first. You go through the, through the worst time first, you learn. Most of people that are not believers will leave the space and do something else with their lives. And it creates uh, this uh, massive vacuum for entrepreneurs and people that dare. And, you know, if you, really, if you really believe in it, but for me, Bitcoin, like, it had nothing to do with Mongox. Mongox is one company failing, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't change the value proposition of of Bitcoin and crypto, so which is why I thought, you know, uh, these guys have lost money, and I'm sorry for people that got involved in this and lost money, but uh, but it doesn't change part, the fundamentals. You're right; it doesn't change the fundamentals, and it's hard. You come from an industry in your advertising industry; it's very professional um, contracts, um, business development. There are industries around your industry. There are industries around those industries around those industries. I mean, it's a huge. Uh, TV shows have been created about it. And now you enter the Bitcoin space, the crypto space. You know, you, you were an advisor and an investor and then, and then you became CEO. Now you're working in a space that's still not dominated, but it's still very much filled with ideological people. And then you have people like me who are young and this was my, this is my only career. I never had a career before. What's it like kind of being the adult in the room? What's it like, um, you know, having to do business deals uh, over handshakes and having to trust people, having to get screwed by people and having to work with people that maybe sometimes you just simply don't want to work with. I mean, I, first, I hope that I'm not the adult in the room. I hope I'm still a cool kid. Uh, Dude, you're in a, you're the adult in the room. Like, have you, you know, I talked to a lot of people on this show. I've released some, a lot of episodes. You definitely are a, uh, a seasoned professional. Um, not trying to flatter you here, I, 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 because I'm the opposite of that. No, I see what you mean. Look, so I think in general the business recipes are always the same. So I, for me, um, what's very different and what's great about Bitcoin and the crypto communities and the the the, the fanatics about this is like you know they're they're a very specific crowd, very hard to please, um, a lot of troll masters, uh, but it makes it so great. Like it, it makes the whole experience even better because you, you, and it proves that actually uh, ideologically or like this is a phenomenon that just, that, ju that goes beyond just business. It's actually, you know, it's actually something that so many people have passion for because it will probably change everything in the next 10, 20, 30 years on how people on the planet exchange value. So it is, it is a fantastic promise. And also it was born, on uh, you know that 2008 financial crisis, and it's a response to that. So it's an amazing uh, response, you know, by the people for the people, etc. So actually, I think it's a it's a hugely democratic process. And of course, because it's democracy, then you have uh, you know a lot of villages uh, that uh, have different opinions, etc. And but you try to 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 run all of this, trying to, uh, to 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 pay attention to what everyone is saying. But anyways, I, I think it makes it. Uh, super interesting, uh, and that's one side. But the other side is, uh, you know, a business is a business. So Ledger, we are a security company. We're selling security products. We're selling security products to sort of everyone right now, whether you're a consumer, whether you're an enterprise, or whether you're in an industry. We are in the security of, we're, we're in the endpoint security. Um, and, and of course, you, you have to be very professional because in the end, the real responsibility is to deliver the right product to, 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 to the people. And so therefore, being professional and run this as a very, very tight ship, uh, it's what you have to do, not just to make money, of course, to make money, but also uh, to be true to your values and to make sure that uh, uh, customers 
have the best possible experience with your product. So there's no shaking hands with Ledger. Everything is uh, by the book, through a contract, etc. And what we, you know, in our word is true. What we say is what we do. I'm so honored that Untold Stories is sponsored by eToro. eToro is the smartest crypto trading platform and one of the largest in the world with over a trillion dollars in trading volume per year. What I really love about eToro is that the CEO has been around the Bitcoin space since 2012, so they really, really put their money where their mouths are. U.S. customers, myself included, we can trade the most popular crypto assets, in fact, almost all of the ones that you want to trade, with low but transparent fees. So you actually know what you're paying for everything. And that's really, really, really important. So if you're not ready to trade yet, you can practice building your portfolio with the eToro $100,000 virtual trading feature. So you can create this whole portfolio without trading with any real money to see how you'll do. And you can learn all the different ins and outs without using any real money yet. And then once you're comfortable, you can enter the market and start buying and selling crypto for real. Best of all, one of my favorite features is that you can connect with 11 million other eToro traders in the world, myself included. And we can talk trading, charts, and all things crypto. So listen, head on over to eToro.com Links are in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. I'd like to thank my sponsor of Untold Stories, Scott Offord. Scott is a Bitcoin mining consultant and provides managed miner hosting services in Texas. If you need to get at least 25 megawatts of miners online in the next three months, Scott wants to talk with you right now. Contact him on Telegram or Twitter at OFFORD. S-C-O-T-T. He's offering an all-in rate of 6.5 cents per kilowatt an hour. Wow, that's like super cheap. That's like electricity cost in the Arctic where things are automatically cooled because it's so cold. So he's offering 6.5 cents per kilowatt an hour without any CapEx required. Or if you commit to $170,000 per megawatt up front, he can get you a rate of 5 cents per kilowatt. Am I reading that right? 5 cents per kilowatt? That's unbelievable. Scott can get your first 25 megawatt hashing within 16 weeks from the date of signing. All the infrastructure, power lines, substations, water lines, and buildings are fully owned by the hosting company. By the end of March 2020, they will already have 150 megawatts online in Texas. This is such a super cool ad to record because my listeners are learning about mining now. Like this is this is really interesting. I, I didn't even know half this half this stuff before I met Scott and he started sponsoring the show. So make sure you check out Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O F F O R D S C O. TT. And Scott, thank you again for being my first ever Untold Story sponsor. Let's talk about Ledger. Now that you bring that up, I uh, want to jump into it. Tell us about the company. And we talked about the founding, but tell us about the products that you guys first launched. Um, tell us why this this technology that you guys uh, are using are is the only is the only uh, you guys are the only company in the space that are that are that is providing this technology and really uh, moving the market forward. Let's talk about the Ledger Nano S and the X. What's the what are the differences between the two products, and what type of people are using it? Sure. So the Nano S and Nano X, that's our consumer division. Uh, these are products that have been designed for an individual use of the products. Um, what the Nano X brings compared to the Nano S is more memory capacity, so you can actually run more apps and play with more coins at the same time. So the difference is like let's say an average of five on your Nano S and it's a hundred on your Nano X. And actually we developed the Nano X because our users were asking to be able to manipulate more coin, uh, more, more coins with, with the Nano. Uh, so that's why we've done it. And you have Bluetooth connectivity. Uh, so that's what's happening. Um, we, we're not the only one in the market to, to provide hardware wallets, as you, as you said before, but... No, of course not. It was I was I guess I was talking about your your uh, operating system. Correct, correct. So Bolos, so so Bolos is our operating system, and that runs into our hardware wallet. Actually, that runs in the secure element that is in our hardware wallet. But if I'm not mistaken, the uh, the reason why Ledger is its own value proposition in the hardware wallet industry is that we are the only hardware wallet to be certified by um, by a third party attacker. So. 
when you do security, um, you can either uh, say that you do security and people have to trust you. You can say that you do security and people and, and they trust you because Ledger has not been hacked so far and we've sold 1.5 million units in 165 countries. So there is evidence that, uh, you know, you don't, you don't see everywhere and every day on Reddit that uh, so-and-so got hacked with their Ledger wallet got hacked. Uh, so that's that's how you build the trust on the brand. <clears throat> then you can also build tools so people can verify that you do actually what you say you do in terms of security. And that's also a possibility with Ledger. And finally, you can have a third party to review your products and um, and give you a certification and give the certification that actually your product does what it does. So typically in the Ledger product, you have a secure element that comes from uh, ST Microelectronics. And in, in security, of course, the secure element has been certified, uh, uh, but uh, we have a global certification of the product, meaning that your Nano S and Nano X have been certified by the ANSI. ANSI is a, is a French agency, French governmental agency that does those kind of evaluations. So actually, the, to my knowledge, the only product in the market that has security certification are the Nano S and Nano X. I came across the other day a, uh, a thought or a problem that I don't know how to internally solve. Maybe you could help me. What happens to these devices 10, 20, 30 years down the road? Um, you know, most people are using hardware wallets, hopefully, to keep their long, their long term, uh, crypto. I want to ask you the difference between a hardware wallet and then like a hardware vault. Do you see like a difference? And then what are your, uh, enterprise products that you're that you're working with with companies and then how do we secure our i know i ask you so many questions don't worry i'm writing them down too but what how do we secure our crypto for the next 30 years do we have to keep getting new hardware wallets every five years i mean flash memory what what's the the life cycle of that yeah so maybe to answer your first and last question in one go i would say that i would the hardware wallet is a decentralized value proposition that allows you to have your private keys and then therefore it allows you to have your coins. And with great powers come great responsibilities. So the value proposition of decentralization is amazing, but it forces you to think about your uh, security. Uh, and so that's, and I actually don't think it's a downside. It's just, I just think that it is something that people should think about. So typically I would discourage anyone to buy a Ledger product, to put coins on it, and then to forget that device for 30 years in a safe. That's actually not the way you should do it. Uh, you should sort of pay attention to your coins. You should make sure that you follow uh, our blog, make sure that uh, you check from time to time if we don't ask you to do a security upgrade because we're improving our products every day, every week, every month. Uh, basically, you should pay attention to what you do for your own security. And this is a digital world. So as you know, every digital product uh, is improving as upgrades, et cetera, et cetera. So, and it's very possible that in time, we'll bring products to the market that are better uh, than uh, the experience that you have today with your Nano S and Nano X. Um, and so therefore, uh, will you have to buy a new device every five years? Maybe, uh, because we believe that... Uh, not because your uh, other devices will be necessarily obsolete, but... But they'll just get better. But they'll just get better. That's one thing. And two, crypto will also evolve a lot. So typically, there are some functionalities today uh, that you have with the Nano S or the Nano X. And those functionalities might need to evolve depending on the protocols, depending on what you want to do. You know, there is a staking that is coming now. There will be lightning, etc. So there will be many new usage that will come. And maybe we'll have to adapt the hardware to adapt to those new usage and maybe you as a consumer you want those new hardwares because you would want to uh, to to use those uh, those new features you're uh, really good at changing my opinion without you realizing you're doing it um mm -hmm. but no what, what, so what did, what did i change well um i i feel like there is a problem of how does someone you know uh hold on to crypto and then if they went into a coma for 20 years and they came out would it still work? But I think I think you have a good point that you made. Maybe you didn't realize it. And I guess your point is the way I saw your point is that our industry is not ready for a 30 year hardware wallet because it's constantly changing. I mean, every year. So something that may what if someone launches a product now that says, hey, this hardware wallet will last for 40 years. Now I may say to myself, I don't know if I want to actually rely on that because the industry is changing so quickly. 
who's to say that this product will even work and you know won't be something that would be um you know out of use in five or six years yeah, it's, it's completely, that is completely it. And plus, in security, no one can tell you, selling you something today and tell you you don't touch it. And in 40 years, you will still, still you will always have the same security features. It will work exactly the same, etc. Because in 40 years, attackers will have evolved. And so the product that you have today will probably be hacked in 40 years if you don't do anything. So actually, security is a, is a moving thing. It's a cat and mouse problem. Uh, and so what we do at Ledger is that we work every day to increase security and to make our products better and to have more features and to develop them. So, so continuously, we increase the security for, for our users, which is why sometimes you have to update the firmware, which is why you, know, you have new features that will appear in Ledger Live in 2020, many of them actually. Uh, and all of this to just give a better service to our users. And, and finally, I think a hardware wallet um, is sometimes perceived as cold storage uh, by... Yes, by that's users. exactly what I wanted to ask you about. Sorry for interrupting you, but that's what... Yeah. That's what. Yeah, so, sorry. No, no, no. I get excited. It's, it's all right, man. No, but it's perceived as cold storage. It's like I put my private keys on it, then I put it in the safe and I do nothing. What we'll try to change and what I was uh, hinting to earlier is that decentralized value propositions have to build services that are as good as uh, centralized value proposition in the future. Uh, Ledger Live for us uh, is the, the software companion of your hardware wallet. And we'll try to make Ledger Live a much more comprehensive and exhaustive experience uh, in, in the future. So when you connect to Ledger Live, you can connect to your world of crypto. And there will be many, many more features uh, other than just making sure that your cryptos are safe and you can check them every day to see that they are still there. But there'll be other features that will allow users to do much more with the Ledger Live experience. And so therefore... How do you Users will engage more with our products. How do you maintain uh, privacy and security, but at the same time, increasing user experience? The reason I ask is because you see a lot of companies, and you know what I'm talking about, a lot of products will uh, sacrifice security and privacy for a better user experience. And I'm not happy with that sacrifice. In fact, I probably made it, I think I made a tweet this morning against sacrifices like that. I don't think we should be sacrificing uh, you, uh, security and privacy for user experience. You've been able to maintain user experience. In fact, uh, user experience has arguably gotten better over the years, but your privacy and security has been able to stay the same. How do you, uh, how do you prevent yourselves from having to get to a point where you have to make that trade-off? Um, well, you know, one, the, the response here will be that the way that we think about our product, our operating system, the way that people can use our nano, uh, is that we want to be an open company. Typically, to give you an example of what this means, today your nano S or your nano X, uh, you can decide to use it with our Ledger Live experience. And, uh, and that's okay, and that's great, and we try to improve the Ledger Live experience every week, every month, uh, and we want to build the best possible Ledger Live experience. However, we didn't block the devices on just Ledger Live. You can actually use your Nano S or Nano X to connect with many other softwares that exist in the industry. And so therefore, if you believe that those softwares bring you a better user experience and or better privacy, you can do so. And we're doing this because we acknowledge the fact that there are many, many communities uh, in, in the market right now, and some of them need a product that is different from Ledger Live, and that's okay because we still want to bring security to these people and we still want to make sure that they have the best security when they use the software that they, um, uh, that, that they, that they want to use. I was going to ask you just what are some, some cool features that you're thinking of, of launching over the next year or two? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's just we want to broaden the experience of, of Ledger Life. So, you know, I want users to be able to buy Bitcoin, swap Bitcoin, stake Bitcoin, uh, st well, stake coins uh, and and do all of these things without changing their security level. Uh, the problem that the industry has today is that if you go from cold to hot, oh shit! Suddenly my coins are in danger. Uh, but this shouldn't happen in the future. That has to change. Meaning that whatever you do with your coins, you should always do it with the same uh, level of security. So what we're trying to bring in the ledger experience is that is sort of everything that users do with their coin every day, but without never having to leave the ledger experience and the ledger security. You're only as strong as your weakest link, right? Correct. I mean, today, like, let's do a, let's do a swap. So you have your coins on ledger, you're happy, you feel you're safe, uh, cold storage. Now you want to do a swap. So what you need to do is 
do a transaction from Ledger to a swap provider, do the swap, enter manually most of the addresses for send, receive, etc., and eventually at some point go back to the safety of your Ledger. We think we can do better than that and sort of streamline that experience. Okay, so that experience will be streamlined, and that's great. Um, but most hardware wallets today and in any software wallet you download, the first thing that you do is it says, you know, back up your keys and they're pretty much, they're all doing the same thing with that is, you know, you have some of them, ev- some of the hardware wallets even come, you know, with, with the piece of paper and it says, write down your backup phrase and it's 24 words. And yeah, you can split it up into like 12 and 12 and keep them in separate, you know, private security vaults in Switzerland and around the world. But 99.9% of the world doesn't do that. And the user experience of having to write down a phrase that you then keep in your safe, you can have the best security on the ledger or, or, or any hardware wallet that you use. But that, that, that to me is still a huge wink, uh, a weak link. And also paper can burn up in fires. Yes, there's crypto steel, but I don't see crypto steel and these others as like a good solution to this. I see as the, they're like stop gaps. What solution can we have? to solve the problem. And, you know, I'm not looking for a, an answer here. I, this is more of like a mental exercise. But what type of solution can we see where the user experience allows someone to to use, to use turn on a wallet, you know, start using it within a few minutes, but at the same time not have to rely on like a backup seed in a, in a safe deposit box somewhere? Because, you know, I, who wants to do that? No, for sure. But I'm glad you're not asking for uh, an answer or a solution because I don't have any for you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no of course not. And I know it's... This a- whole show is a mental exercise, by the way. Correct. Uh, no, no, good. But like it's a, it's a, but it's something that we have going on in R&D. So we're thinking hard about that problem. It's not that we believe that uh, that 24 thing is the alpha and omega and we're so happy with it. Like, you know, we, uh, we, we believe it's a necessary evil right now. And Everything that you said is what we, the advice that we give to our users. Uh, but uh, in R&D, we're thinking about different things uh, to probably uh, s- smooth the problem going forward and make it, uh, make it less of a problem. Have you guys like uh, come up with anything interesting? Any, without giving too many secrets, have you maybe like thought of doing something more mental or on paper or physical? I mean, what, how, how do you even like, approach this subject how do you even start investigating well you know again this on this i can i cannot say too much because a uh, the reality is like we don't like so even if i would say something today we don't have a solution a silver bullet where this problem is sold so we don't have that uh, but uh, when we do how the way that we run the company is like we try to you know have the goals uh, the goals for the company for 2020 and we just finished that exercise um, and typically working on the coin governance and working on, on this issue is part of the uh, R&D roadmap for next year. Uh, and so all this to say that we understand it's a you know, sort of sticking point for the industry and we are not uh, looking over it. We actually, you know, uh, we will try to think about that, uh, although we don't have a solution right now, but it is something that is in our roadmap. I can't wait for a solution for that to come out because I still feel like that's where um, that's where our one of our weakest links are. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm, and I'm happy that you have an R&D department to, to work on that. And I hope that other companies are too. I guess it frustrates me when you have new products come out and they're not taking privacy and security properly. You have an enterprise division. Um, a lot of people don't know about that. What are you, What is it that you guys do? Who are your typical clients? And how do you help them do better at their own crypto security? Yeah, so the, the business division is called Ledger Vault. Uh, and it's true that because it came in a sort of number two in our, in our, in our business, and, and we've been known for the Nano S, so in general, people know Ledger Vault a little less. Uh, however, we have a team that is on the ground and has been meeting with the various players that we're sending this solution to. And, you know, now we start to have a good footprint and, and, uh, and a great solution, by the way. Uh, and Ledger Vault is, uh, is leveraging still the same operating system. Uh, we're leveraging different uh, hardware uh, technology because now we use hardware security modules. And we offer uh, a software as a service uh, solution to hedge funds, banks, financial institutions of various sorts, 
um, uh, coins, foundations. I mean, anyone who has coins and need multiple access to these coins. Because the problem is most of the industry actually today runs on hardware wallets, even the you know even financial institutions. But it's a uh, it's actually something that they shouldn't do because the hardware wallet has been designed for a single use. And okay, you can have multi sig, and some people have uh, have done that, uh, and you can do that with uh, with the Ledger Nano S. But for larger financial institution, this is not something you know multi sig on the Ledger Nano S is not something that they can present to their limited partners or to their board. So they need something that is a bit more sophisticated, and that brings more reinsurance to you know their clients, investors, and so on and so forth. And so Ledger Vault has been designed to do security because it's always at the heart of what we do and governance. So how do you access the coins? Who has the right to access the coins? What kind of transactions can they make, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the specificity of Ledger is always the same. Everything runs uh, with secure hardware, with our operating system into the secure hardware. And the secure hardware, that it's called hardware security modules, have been tested uh, by our, our dungeon, which is our attack lab internally. They've been patched when we found uh, bugs on those uh, on those uh, HSMs, uh, so they run with the maximum level of security today. Uh, and uh, everything, whether it's the signature and or the governance, is enforced by the hardware. Um, How does that work? Well, usually the way most of what most of the industry does is they use hardware security modules, but the hardware security modules are only used to sign. So basically, you have a business uh, business like like the chip in your credit card. It's like just used to sign. Correct. So you have a signal that is coming from outside the hardware that goes into the hardware, and the hardware signs it. The problem with most of what the industry does is, how do you know that the signal that got into the hardware was actually the right one? Uh, so what we do at Ledger is every business rule is enforced by the secure hardware. So. When you ask the hardware uh, security model to sign, it is actually coming from business rule that has been also secured by the hardware. So you're 100% sure that the business rule and the signature are both um, secure. That's unbelievable. Um, can, this is, is hard, how, can this can this hardware security module? See, I didn't know this. Can this be now expanded to do to do other things? And can 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 they work with each other? So I guess my question is. If people have, and I'm just saying this shit out loud, if multiple people have ledgers, can their HSMs within it um, multi, uh, assign, you know, multi, like you said, m multiple transactions? Can you have each ledger acting as a, a key in a two of three or four of five or, you know, six of ten uh, secret type of thing? And that could be potentially good for enterprise. That's, that's exactly what we do. I, I love it. That's that's um, that's such a fantastic product for um, for the future of this space. Going forward, you guys have 130 team members. I read here. Um, are you guys continuing to hire? Where and can I have a job? No, I'm just kidding. A lot of our listeners are based all over the world, um, and I always like to talk about this at the end of the episode. What type of people are you looking for? Uh, how can they reach you? And um, what's it like working for Ledger? What's your corporate culture like? Yeah, sure. Uh, so right now we are 165, I think. Oh, uh, crap. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we are recruiting 50 people around, mostly uh, engineers. Uh, if you, for the listeners, actually, if you go on ledger.com, we have a uh, a job page uh, where um, most of our job are listed, but on the 50 recruitments that we do, I think uh, 40 are engineers. So for us, 2020 is about sort of doubling down on the tech, the product, uh, and and sort of uh, um, have a higher pace when it comes to bringing new features and and our product to, to market. That's uh, that's what even in this bear market, though. I mean, what what would would you, would you guys be looking at that differently? based on the market that we're in? No, I mean, I think this is the moment. Like, you know, you need to invest when the market is bearish, not when the market is bullish. When the market is bullish, we'll be just taking the orders and 
you know, our, I fucking our, love it. You're our, right. Our brains will freeze, and you know, <laughs> it, it, and actually, it's great to invest in the bearish market because you are in the bearish market. You are very conscious about like every dollar you spend. Like you are being very careful. So your plan in the bearish market is a better plan than when you're in the bullish market. 2017 was just too crazy. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't even think. I didn't really understand why we were being so successful, to be honest. And for me, it was a problem. Like when you're very successful and you don't know why. It means that you can't replicate. Uh, the building a business is about being uh, able to replicate and being able to forecast. And so me, I was incapable of forecasting and replicating whatever business that we had in 2017, which was very scary and troubling. So actually, I prefer the bear market to, to build products because you know, you know what your bottom is. Uh, and now it's just a question of building and it's just a question about perfection in execution. So now you have, um, you have this bear market and... Um, do you think other companies are doing the same thing and, you know, kind of doubling down because what you're saying is so true, you know, uh, a funny story is that like, I, you know, I have friends who live off of Bitcoin and they only hold Bitcoin. And so now that it's a bear market, they're like joking around They're they're, they're, you know, they're eating ramen and flying economy. But when the price was pumping, they were all flying first class and things like that and eating and eating steaks, um, even though they're, they're still holding the same amount of Bitcoin. But, um, if you hadn't gotten into the space, you know, you're the leader of this company. If you had not gotten into the space in, at, at the height of, you know, when the bull market, right when it burst, and so your first few years was during a bear market, then you had a bull market, now we're in a bear market again. If you had joined in a bull market, do you think your outlook and your views of what we just talked about would be different? If I had joined in a bull market, uh Right, right now, you, you know, you told me something very disciplined. You said during the bear market, we should be doubling down. We should be, be careful of our dollar. We should be investing more into the space, hiring more people. You're a thousand percent right. The problem is it's not, it's a lot easier to say it than it is to do it. Bear markets are scary. You ask yourselves, is crypto going to even exist in a few years? Uh, a lot of companies are just saying, we're just going to, a lot of companies, I have guests on this show, 40s, they, they all tell me this. A lot of them tell me the same thing. We're going to save our money. We're not going to hire. We're not going to do anything. We're just going to get really lean during the bear market. And then when the bull market comes, we'll hire again and we'll grow. That's the wrong way. That's not the right way to do it. So I guess my question to you is, if you had joined in a bull market, do you think your outlook or your discipline would be as strong? Yes, because... I, the short answer is yes. And the reason is, you know, I've built businesses before and in advertising, you know, we were, I've been in you know, some of my companies before Credio or with Credio, uh, which was my previous company, you know, sort of going up and down and up and down. And so I've been managing businesses going down and managing businesses going up. I always preferred managing businesses going down as long as they come back up at some point, which I always managed to do. But, uh, but so, so actually when I look at a business, you know, for me, it doesn't really matter whether the market uh, is, is bullish or bearish. It's, it's, it's all about building the best possible company. So I don't really focus on the market. I focus more on, on the company and, what, how to make it the best possible company, but maybe um, a different ledger has a as a type of technology that uh, doesn't do just Bitcoin, and so it depends also what your business is. If my business or my holdings were only Bitcoin, I don't know. Maybe I would have a, a different way of thinking about building my product and my company. Maybe I wouldn't be as bullish, but uh, but I'm very bullish right now because. We do endpoint security. And what happened in 2019, I think it's a pivotal year and it's very important because we went from Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, so let's say public protocols, and there was always this invention of blockchain and you know no one really knew what blockchain meant. But uh, but now you have other type of protocols that, are, that have seen light in 19, such as Libra or Gram, and all these protocols are sort of pushing governments to think about their own coins, so whether it's the Chinese government. And all of this will be backed by a blockchain and all of this will be private keys and, and will have the need for security and governance. And for Ledger, that's, that's a business. And finally, you have financial institutions that are sometimes touching Bitcoin, but most of them, even when they're not touching Bitcoin, are thinking about the tokenization of uh, of their assets and that security tokens and all that tokenization world. And you know, and for us, that's also a business that will need security. So the reason I'm bullish and why we're investing is because we feel that businesses, token businesses, sort of fueled by blockchains, will be many in the future. 
Bitcoin, Bitcoin will succeed or not, but whatever is the fate of Bitcoin, uh, tokenization is here to happen. Uh, and blockchains will be the backbone of financial, uh, will be the technological back- backbone of financial institutions in the future, and we'll be here to secure the shit out of it. I was going to get all serious and end the show, but then you made me laugh. You're right. And thank you for saying everything you said. Uh, being agnostic as a business is super important. Pascal Gutier, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. CEO of Ledger, your, your two products, the Ledger X and the Ledger S, are two of the most well-known products in the space. If you guys have not tried out their hardware wallets, uh, they're probably going to be running a lot of holiday specials. Check them out. Thank you so much again for taking the time, and happy holidays to you and your family. Yeah, it's Black Friday week right now, so you should come to ledger.com and, and buy your wallet. It's a good time. Well, th- if this episode gets released before Black Friday in a few days, uh, are there any coupon codes or anything that, that our customers, our listeners can can get a discount or check out? It's 30% off for everyone on the site right now. So no coupon. It's, uh, it's a good deal. I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and I'll talk to you later. Thank you for having me. Sorry. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. New episodes of Untold Stories are released every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m. EST on untoldstories.com, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Untold Stories is produced by Jason Yanowitz, Michael E. Polito, Reed Hannaford, and Riley Silbert of Blockworks Group. Our account executives are Gina D. Felice and Julie Muroff. Our content is written by Kathy Zolo, Ronnie Tishner, and Scott Offer. Special thanks to Wayne Dallaire from Jump Dog Audio Productions. And of course, I'm your host, Charlie Shrem. You can follow me on Twitter, at Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation. Send me some messages, feedback, or anything you want to say. And remember, please give some love to my sponsors, and I'll see you next week. Remember, strength in numbers. And information is power.